Good afternoon and welcome back to my workbench where today it's a uh, lovely overcast Saturday 18th of November and I've got something to play around with once more as usual. Um, I just want to apologise in advance if you hear any lawn mowing noises in the background. Um, seems like all the neighbours have decided to mow their lawns at once. And apologize as well for not having any videos out recently. Um, it's been um, not a great time, actually. Uh, there's been several deaths, uh, both in the family and out of the family, um, all within the space of a few weeks. So it's all a bit all a bit of a mess, but I suppose things have to go on. And that's what I'm trying to do right now, is uh, just do something. So, um, yeah, anyway. So, <laughs> this is a um, another LCD monitor that I've uh, got to muck about with, and it's obviously faulty, otherwise why would I be doing anything with it? Um, this particular one, this particular one I've had for quite a while now, um, I bought it faulty and haven't really done anything with it until today. Um, I bought it at the same time, around the same time as I bought that one, uh, which I've also repaired previously. Um, it had a completely blown up power supply uh, due to a failure of the filtering capacitor which caused a cascade failure of the power factor controller circuitry and also a um, destruction of the main PSU controller chip and a bunch of other components. Um, but that was fixable and this has been working great as a workbench thing so I'm happy about that. Um, but I basically got two at the same time and thought well you know if I can't fix one I can fix the other hopefully. Um, that one was a dollar <laughs> I think on Trade Me and this was about fifteen dollars so you know not too bad anyway. Um, I finally got around to thinking, well, I might as well try and do something with this one. Anyway, so the fault... Um, the fault with this one is... a little bit odd. Well, not too odd, but there's different anyway. Um, when you apply power and turn it on, uh, it all works seems to work fine, but it only does so for about 20 seconds and then it will shut off again. Um, everything goes off, backlight, image, power LED, everything just goes off completely, um, which is... Mm, initially I kind of thought, hey, it could be a backlight problem, as is so often the case with monitors, um, but it doesn't appear to be so. Um, it seems that everything just shuts down. So, oh yes, by the way, it's a uh, Dell ST2420LB, um, which is a 24-inch LCD, uh, same as that one. Well, this is a 16 to 9, this is a 16 by 16 to 10 ratio, so, you know, same same diagonal size, but different aspect ratios. Uh, personally, I like the 16 to 10, because you get the uh, higher higher screen resolution on the vertical axis and it's nicer for displaying schematics and stuff, this is my personal preference um, but this one should be good too if I can get it working anyway, um, main difference I guess, this, this one is a uh, LED backlight instead of a CCFL and it's got capacitive touch buttons instead of tactile buttons um, but other than that, it's just a basic LCD monitor, nothing fancy, it's got HDMI VGA and DVI inputs. Uh, I don't know if it does picture in picture like this one does. Um, and it's also got like an audio pass through connector, which doesn't really seem to make much sense to be honest. Um, there's no inbuilt speakers into this, which is probably a good thing considering how thin it is, they'd sound terrible if it did have any. Uh, but I guess it provides a headphone jack on your monitor and probably a volume control as well, I guess, so it 
could be useful, but uh, probably nothing I'd ever use. Um, anyway, apart from that, uh, back to the fault. Anyway, so like I said, you turn it on, it runs for about 20 seconds, everything looks okay, and then it just shuts off. And it stays off for about another 20 seconds, and then it will turn back on again, and the cycle just repeats over and over. Um, and yeah, like I said, initially I thought, you know, well, the image goes out, or the backlight goes out, it could be a backlight fault. Uh, LED backlights seem to be just as bad at failing as CCFLs, so in terms of reliability, <laughs> I don't think it makes much difference. Um, this particular one, however, I don't think it's the backlight, because if you take a torch, shine a bright torch on the screen of a monitor, uh, you can generally tell if there's still an image on the screen, because when the backlights go out, it's usually a case of... Um, I mean, this is this this circuit here is the backlight drive circuitry um, that takes about 16 volts and steps it up to I suppose 50 volts or something for the LEDs. Um, there'd be a, lots of probably two or four strings of them. Um, well, we got six wires going to the going out of this thing, so I don't know. It could be four four strings with two grounds. I, I don't know. Anyway, um, and probably quite a few. So quite a high voltage, uh, probably at least 50 volts, maybe 100 volts, could be, I don't know, I think 80 is about the average voltage, but anyway, um, usually what happens though if there's a fault with the backlights drawing too much current or going shorted or something, um, especially with the CCFL one, um, the inverter will shut down, but the rest of the monitor usually still runs fine, because the inverter itself will just shut off due to a fault, but Obviously, the scalar board, the power supply is still running, so there's, the image is usually still on the screen, but you just can't see it because the backlights have gone off. And if you shine a torch on the front of the monitor, you can often see the picture there. Um, and in that sort of case, the power LED is usually still on at the same time. So that's a good indication of the problem. With the LED one, though, um, I mean, with this one, uh, everything shuts off, there's no picture, there's no backlight, even the power LED goes off, so it's probably not the backlights or the backlight driver. Um, another reason why I suspect that is because the thing can run for 20 seconds, and typically that could be uh, that could be fine for a CCFL backlight, and in fact one monitor I paired which had um, really bad condition CCFLs due to worn out, you know, the, the actual glass I think had cracked and the, it was surprising that they ran at all but the thing would run for about 10 minutes um, perfectly fine and then it would shut down. Uh, with LED backlights though, um, usually one of the LEDs goes shorted or goes open circuit and the LED backlight driver will generally detect that in a matter of seconds or even just one second and it'll shut down pretty much instantly or maybe not even turn on at all so um, to run for 20 seconds perfectly fine um, it seems unlikely that it's an LED problem it could be the actual driver itself but the LEDs themselves are probably okay anyway what I've done um, I've soldered some wires on to all the three voltage rails in the power supply. Now this power supply provides a 5 volt rail, a 3.3 volt rail, and a, well, I call it an 18 volt rail, but it's, it changes depending on the load, but uh, it's about 16 volts when the backlights are running and about 20 volts when the backlights are not running. Uh, anyway, three rails, so I'm measuring all three of them at once. And basically what I discovered was that when you apply power, which I'll just do now, although you probably can't see much, because, um, yeah, it's obviously face down, but you can see the uh, power LED comes on. We've got 3.3 volts over there, perfectly fine. 5 volts there, 16.6 volts here. Um, obviously, if you could see under here the uh, power, uh, you can probably see the backlight there, possibly coming out from there, I'm not sure. Um, and if you look there, there's, you know, if you can look under here, there's an image. Um, no signal input thing bouncing around the screen. Now, this will run like this fine for a little bit. I said 20 seconds, I'm not sure exactly. Um, 
how long it was, but something like that, about a minute or less, I think. Um, basically what happens is it'll run, and we'll see in a, in, in a, in a second what will happen, I think. Um, so you probably can't see the displays on these multimeters here. You might be able to see that one, but basically if you just check the uh, the power LED here, and <laughs> you should be able to see what happens soon. Possibly. I don't know. Come on. Come on. It'd be funny if it proved me wrong, but I don't think so. It seems pretty consistent fault so far as I've looked at it. There we go. Power LED goes off. This is dropping down quickly. It's gone to 0 volts now. This is 1 volt dropping, and this has gone to 12 volts. And the backlight's gone off. Everything's gone off. If I hit the uh, power button, nothing happens. If I unplug the power supply, uh, press the button again, nothing happens. I can plug it back in. It won't do anything. Um, press the power button, it's gone off, everything's off, voltages, everything's down. Um, so it just seems to just cut out uh, the power supply, is basically shutting down for whatever reason, I'm not sure yet um, what that reason is. So, and then now it's just tried to start up again, obviously there was still some voltage in the main filter capacitor there. Um, basically, yeah, so I'm just going to try and figure out now uh, what's actually going on, and there's basically, I think, two main causes that could be the problem here. Um, one, obviously, is the power supply itself could be faulty. Um, a little strange that it may run for a minute or so and then shut down, but it's possible. Um, the controller IC might be overheating, might be faulty, might be overheating. Um, there's also a little 3-pin regulator on the back of the board just under here which supplies the 3.3 volt rail regulated from the 5 volt rail. Maybe that's overheating or something and shorting out temporarily, I, I don't know. Um, a short on any of these rails should cause the power supply to shut down, so possibly there's a overload or a temporary short from some faulty thing. Um, maybe one of these diodes is wonky, I don't know. I'm guessing it's probably not in the LED driver because this voltage still stays up. It's gone back to 14 volts now. Um, obviously after the PSU tried to kick back on again. But if this was shorted or was overloading, I'd expect that voltage to go low. And, you know, this is the filter cap for this this uh, voltage rail to feed this. Um, that would get drained instantly and this would go to zero. So the fact that it goes just only down to 12 kind of suggests that um, the problem is probably not in this area. And like I said, when, it, when it's running, the LED is all light fine, so um, that's probably not it. However, the 3.3 volt rail does come down pretty fast um, when the problem occurs. The 5 volt rail also goes down quite quickly. Um, not as fast as the 3.3, so possibly... Um, I have noticed that this there's a little 3 pin voltage regulator on the main board here. It's probably like a triple one seven or similar LDO, maybe probably does like one point eight volts for the microcontroller or whatever. Um, if that was causing an overload or something, um, there is uh, there is a patch on it which could be a discoloration, um, maybe from overheating. But the board itself around doesn't look overheated, so maybe not. Um, that would be one of the first suspects. Those little little regulators on boards in that very often go faulty. Uh, obviously, you know, power regulators, they just they work hard, they fail more often than other things. Um, that's one of the ideas. But basically, uh, my next p uh, point of troubleshooting, um, now that I know what's happening, so we know the power supply is shutting off completely. So that's um, different to if, say, for example, the voltages all stayed perfectly fine, but everything else went off. It would tell us that, well, default is probably on the actual scalar board um, itself. And the inverter is actually controlled with two wires providing the enable and the um, brightness control through this connector and then pass through to this connector. So 
you know, say for example, if all the voltages stayed are up, um, but this board here was faulty in some way, it could be telling the inverter to shut down, or you know, not giving it that enable signal, and it could also be shutting down because the power LED is driven from this board here. That would happen, but obviously we can see all the voltages actually go off, the power supply actually shuts down and then waits a while and then tries to turn back on again and then it runs for a bit and then it shuts down again. So it is quite possible it's a PSU fault of some kind. Um, maybe you know one of the semiconductors in this board is, is faulty, possibly that 3.3 volt regulator. Or it could be that there's an overload somewhere and the board is shutting down from an overload or perceived short. Uh, anyway, I think I just said that, but what I'm going to do... Next point, uh, because I don't suspect the LED backlight driver to be a problem, it seems okay, I'm just going to focus on the two rails feeding the scalar board. So the 5 volt and the 3.3 volt rails, what I'm going to do is I'm going to desolder the wires for those, and I'm going to put the multimeters in series with that, measuring current. And I want to see how much current this thing draws. I want to see two things. One, I want to see what's the average current it draws while it's running. And two, I want to see if the current is creeping up over time or if it spikes just before everything turns off. Because that would be an indication of... Well, it'll tell me basically if there's an overload being pulled from this board here. And if not, then it will also tell me what the nominal, nominal uh, load is on this board so I can... Um, do a load test on the power supply and you know with just some power resistors or something and we can figure out you know whether or not this um that's the uh, power supply or this we can see what happens so that's my next um next thing i'm going to try so i won't uh i won't video all that of me taking the wires and and swapping everything around but i'll uh wait till i've done that and then i'll show what actually the result of that is on the on the meters um, but yeah that's basically the next idea is just to find out well the power supply is shutting down completely um, now we should figure out what's causing it to shut down is it itself or is it the load um, pretty simple then once we figure out that we can then go into more detail in whichever board is the problem hopefully and, and figure out um, what's going on so yeah Okay, so now I've got uh, some stuff rearranged. Um, this meter here is now reading the uh, LED backlight voltage, just because, well, you know, just keep these, uh, stop these leads from flying around and me having to bother desoldering them right now. Um, this meter here is reading the current draw on the 5 volt rail, and this one's measuring the current draw on the 3.3 volt rail. So if I turn this on again, I plug it in, and we see what happens. I'm not sure if you can see this. Uh, starts at 170 milliamps on 3.3 volts, and then when the monitor comes on, it goes up to 280. So you've got 280 milliamps on 3.3, 786 milliamps on 5 volts, and that's all pretty stable, and the monitor's running. Um, so, the so first thing is obviously, uh, I'm not seeing anything creeping up. It's all staying pretty stable, so it tells me that, you know, um, Probably there's nothing on the load that's just just like faulty and slowly drawing too much current, um, because that can be a problem. If the current just slowly creeps up because of some faulty thing, then it'll trip the protection eventually, and the power supply will shut down. That doesn't seem to be the case. Um, everything seems to be fine. Whether or not this is a correct value, operating value, I mean, it probably is. Um, it's fairly low current. I wouldn't expect it to draw a huge amount. Um, seems to be, you know, what I'd expect for a circuit like this. And the monitor does work okay when it's running. Um, so, I mean, if this wasn't, if this current was too high, I'd expect the power supply. There we go, and it shuts down. And now everything's gone to zero. So, I didn't see a current spike just before that shut down. Um, and the current didn't seem to be very high either to begin with, so I would say, um, just unplug it again, um, I would say that probably uh, those currents there are the probably the normal operating currents for those rails. Um, seem fairly, fairly typical sort of thing you'd expect. Um, 
I don't know, obviously I haven't tested the current draw on the LED backlight. I suppose I could do that as well, just for completeness. Um, but yeah, let's just uh, see what current that comes up with and um, give that a try. So, let's plug this back in again. So we got here? 800, 400, 800. Okay, so it's turning on and off. 800 milliamps, 8.08, and that's uh, running. So, okay, so let's just see. 800 milliamps on the LED backlight rail, so that's at 16 volts, approximately. 16.6. Does it go up, does it go down? Seems pretty stable so far. Hmm. I mean, at least the good thing about this fault is it's consistent, it's not intermittent or anything, it sort of um, makes things a lot easier to fix. What was that? 7.99, okay, it's a slight variation. Anything funny? And it goes off, and just goes to zero. So yeah, it seems to be holding steady at 800 milliamps. Um, until everything went off, so hmm, nothing, nothing suspicious there really, is there? Nothing, nothing odd. So I'm gonna guess that um, for uh, for all intents and purposes, it looks like the power supply itself is the problem. Um, looks like it just isn't working properly. But it's uh, I've been here for a while, mucking around with this, so. I'll probably stop at this point and maybe come back tomorrow. <laughs> okay, it's the next day and I'm just recording the next segment in this um, for the fourth time in a row because I've just managed to mess up the recording four times in a row. Well, three times in a row. <laughs> um, first time I just didn't know what I was saying and the second time I recorded the audio with no video and the third time I recorded the video with no audio. So, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> but anyway... Fourth time, lucky, possibly. <laughs> yeah. Right. Anyway, so, last night I decided to investigate this thing a bit more, and think about it a bit more, and I decided to go to the data sheets and start reading up on things I could look at. Basically, um, when you're troubleshooting something, it's really smart to find all the data sheets you can, find all the uh, application notes and things like that, um, get a good idea of what the circuit is supposed to be doing, get an idea of how the circuit works. Um, if you've got an integrated circuit somewhere, for example, you know the control chip here is what we're looking at. It's going to be the main sort of thing to look at at this point. So you want to know like how the feedback system works and all that kind of thing, and you want to figure out, well, we can measure those voltages, measure the waveforms, um, and just see, do they make sense? Do the uh, does the do the examples in the data sheets match what we're actually seeing? Does it make sense, or is something weird going on? Um, so I was reading through there, and it came to this point here, which I found quite interesting. They're talking about the over temperature protection, which is built into that IC. So they say here, hysteretic over temperature protection. Temperature protection is provided by a precision analog circuit that turns the output MOSFET off when the junction temperature exceeds the thermal shutdown temperature, which is apparently 142 degrees C, or approximately. Uh, when the junction temperature cools to below the lower hysteretic temperature point, normal operation resumes, thus providing automatic recovery. And this is an interesting point here. A large hysteresis of 75 degrees C is provided to prevent overheating of the PC board due to a continuous fault condition. VC, or V-control, which they're talking about the voltage on the control pin, which is pin 2, is regulated in hysteretic mode and a 4.8 to 5.8 volt typical triangle waveform is present on the control pin while in thermal shutdown. And I thought about that and I thought, you know, that really does fit um, with what I'm seeing here. And um, we got a sort of a slow, 
a slow fault, things probably slowly heat up, then it shuts off, slowly cools down, turns back on again. Makes sense, tens of, tens of seconds, we've got 20, 30, 40 seconds or something of operation and then the same amount of, amount of time until it starts up again. Um, which would be different from, say, a short circuit. If this thing, if you powered this up directly into a short circuit, it would just make a ticking noise as it just kept attempting to start up, but would never, never get anywhere. Um, which is what most of these kind of things do. Uh, this this particular chip is actually really, really quite complicated and has a lot of protection and monitoring and self-analysis and stuff built into the chip. Um, so it can do, it can, it can protect against over voltage and over short circuits and all that kind of thing and over temperature apparently, um, which is interesting. So given all that concept I thought I'd just do a quick and dirty non-scientific approach and shove my finger on it just after it shut down. And it turns out it was pretty damn hot really, to be honest. Um, and kind of makes sense. So it's uh, the uh, so far what I've seen is all sort of um, fitting with the idea of it is possibly overheating. And I also had a look at this uh, reference design. Um, they provided I think an evaluation board or something um, for designers possibly. Um, and this shows a this shows a thermal image of the example board they provide. Um, or one that they've built themselves, whatever, not entirely sure. And this shows various temperatures of various components. Now the hottest part is actually the uh, resistor up here, the snubber resistor, part of the snubber network. But the um, IC itself is actually relatively cool compared to that and the uh, NTC thermistor in the, in the primary side. Uh, looks like, going by this, it's not running any more than really about 57 degrees. Um, and this is actually with a higher load and a lower line voltage, which means less efficiency um, than what I've got here, which is also open air, low low ambient temperature. And this is about a 20 watt load, as I calculated from what I uh, measured from the currents uh, yesterday. And that sort of makes sense. Um, it also goes to show that the current draw from the LED backlight and the main board is pretty low and it's probably about half of what this example thing was um, so really I shouldn't expect this chip at all to be going anywhere above really 55 degrees it should be staying below that especially given the cool room and open air but when I stuck my finger on it it was definitely a lot hotter than that um, I would say so I decided to do some sensible uh, analysis of it this time and actually measure the temperature directly with a the thermocouple. Okay, obviously it's not going to be really good because the thermal conductivity between that and the case is not that great and of course we can't measure the actual dye temperature or the whatever but you know give us some sort of idea of we shouldn't see it anywhere hotter than 60 degrees even then that would be sort of abnormal given the given the thing so it shouldn't really be above 50, 55 I, I would suspect um, and of course we can also measure the uh, this uh, control pin and see if we've got this this triangle wave here um, to do with the thermal shutdown uh, mode. So what I'm going to do is I've actually obviously hooked that up and I'm going to run it and we're going to measure this temperature and have a look at the control pin voltage and we'll see what actually happens. Okay, so got everything ready to power up and we can see um, <laughs> the temperature is actually pretty much bang on 21 degrees, which is what the uh, example test temperature was. Um, so I've got the oscilloscope probe on pin 2, the control pin, I've got the thermal probe just stuck on there with a bit of tape. Um, like I said, not that great, but it'll give us some indication of what's going on. Okay, so I'm actually reshooting this segment, as is probably apparent. Um, the first bit, the uh, thing didn't go so well and you couldn't really see what was going on with the control pin waveform, so um, I've set everything back up again and I'm going to try it again, which is why the temperature is different, everything's in a different place and the camera angle has completely changed. <laughs> yes, anyway, okay, so let me just show you what happens. So I've actually got this set to AC coupling um, because otherwise we get the DC offset and it's hard to tell what's going on and the uh, waveform is quite small because it's only 1 volt and the thing is probably running you know, 10 and 15 volts DC and you've got AC of 1 volt on top of that. So I've put on AC coupling 
and the temperature is measured here and I'll plug it in and you should be able to see the backlight come on uh, coming out of the edge of the panel here where the connector goes in and if I press the power button there we go okay so the monitors come on oh, it's a bit out of focus isn't it So you can see the uh, temperature rapidly increases and quickly exceeds the temperature that the example board was showing. Um, so it's, it's um, yeah, it's not very happy, is it? The temperature should not be going this high and it should not be going that high that fast. Um, as I said, it should be, should be staying under 55 degrees probably. But it's going up a lot higher and a lot faster than that. Um, and just keeps going up. And eventually, if we wait long enough, <laughs> um, and there we go. So about 90, 93 degrees. We're starting to see this triangle waveform. And now the temperature is coming back down. And the chip will basically cool off. It'll go back to about 50 degrees on the outer case. And if we wait for that. And it reaches about 55 degrees and the chip starts up again and the monitor turns back on and it just repeats the process over and over. So it's definitely th getting very hot and it's definitely going to thermal limiting mode. So I guess the next question is basically, well, why? And of course I'm not entirely sure of the, of the answer, but I have a few uh, likely scenarios in mind which could be the problem. Um, obviously the um, power MOSFET inside that IC, the one that does the switching, is um, most likely the source of all the heat generated. Uh, I don't think it would be the rest of the circuitry in the IC because if there was, if it was dissipating that much power, it would be either because of a uh, over voltage condition on the inputs or some internal fault in the circuitry, and likely it would have blown up by now if there was something wrong with that. So. It seems like it's all kind of mostly working, but um, it's just getting too hot. And uh, yeah, so the the power MOSFET in there, switching MOSFET, um, probably two possible reasons: uh, either the MOSFET itself is damaged and is not working properly, or the uh, control circuitry is not switching it properly for some reason. Um, obviously, with a switch mode power supply. Uh, the MOSFET is designed to be turned either completely on or completely off at any given time. And this makes sense because MOSFETs, modern MOSFETs, uh, have a have a resistance when they're turned fully on um, that is quite low. It's usually in the milliohms. Um, and the parameter in the data sheet is called RDS on, which stands for resistance from drain to source when it's fully on. And um, that's how a switching switch mode power supply is so efficient. It's um, very low power dissipation uh, at any given time because if the MOSFET is switched off um, obviously there's no power flow or there well there may be some small leakage current but it'll be very tiny and there'll be no power dissipated at all really um, and when it's switched fully on the on resistance of the MOSFET is so low that even a high current passing through it does not um, generate much heat because there's not a huge amount of power dissipation um, this is different when the MOSFET is in linear mode, which is halfway, but well not halfway, but any sort of point between off and on. It's not fully off and not fully on. 
um, at that point uh, the resistance of the drain to source channel um, that that changes drastically and is not as low as when it's fully on and so um, if the MOSFET's operating in linear mode such as in an audio amplifier uh, it will be dissipating a lot more power at the same current because the resistance is higher and that's why audio amplifiers typically have much larger heat sinks but this chip doesn't even need a heat sink because it's not supposed to be dissipating much power at all um, however obviously there's something wrong with this one so the control circuitry in the in the IC could be faulty in some way and may not be switching it entirely on so it may have a too high resistance and therefore overheating or it could be switching it too slowly so that the uh, it, it's staying too long in the linear region while it's switching from off to on that, that could be another problem so it could be some issue with that um, I say the most that that's probably the most likely suspect, is, uh, to my mind. Number one would be the chip itself. There's just something internally wrong with it, and it's not working as it should do, and therefore the MOSFET's not being switched properly, or it's being or or it's already damaged in some way. It could have had some ESD event. Could be a mere manufacturing defect. I don't know. This monitor is was pretty clean when I got it. Um, it doesn't look like it's had much use that I can see, so um, it doesn't seem to be an old age thing, it's possibly just a a different kind of failure manufacturing problem maybe. The other problem could be that the MOSFET is being affected by outside circuitry. Um, and now, because the IC does all its control internally, um, there's not really anything external that could affect the control section. Um, the feedback loop, everything, I mean, when it's running it's running fine, the voltages are all in spec and stable and everything, so I can't imagine there's anything wrong with the feedback. Um, the power supply to it seems fine as well. Nothing really um, seems to be an issue there. So I can't see I can't see that being a problem. If it was a feedback problem or or some sort of thing, in that, in that case I'd expect the power supply wouldn't run for more than a second really. It would just either shut down or blow up. Uh, um, but it's possible that the snubber network for the uh, IC, yeah, this diode here, well, I suppose you can't really see that, but <laughs> you know the, the snubber diode or the snubber capacitor, um, if one of those was faulty, leaky possibly, or, or going open circuit um, at some point in the uh, operation, then maybe there's a there's a voltage spike, or it's. I mean, if the diode was leaky or the capacitor was leaky, it could be, it could be um, affecting the turn-on speed of the MOSFET. It could be doing something weird to it. I'm not entirely sure if that's possible. Um, I don't know uh, the in-depth theory of uh, how it all works, but um, yes, I mean, one of these components could be doing something weird. Uh, seems unlikely, though. Again, I'd sort of expect it to. Um, I'd expect more of an outright failure and the thing to just and, and something to just blow up. And seeing as nothing's really done that, it's um, seems more likely it's just the chip that's bad. Uh, the transformer, I suppose, could be faulty, but um, again, that seems sort of unlikely because it's one of those things that you'd that I would typically um, see associated with just an instant failure. It would just either never start up or it would just shut down immediately. And the fact that it can run at all, and, this, and the voltages are all correct, just sort of doesn't really support the fact that it's anything other than the MOSFET or the snubber components, I, I would say. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace that IC first, because I think that's the number one suspect. Um, and I've bought some new ones from DigiKey. <laughs> uh, that's why this video has taken a while to make. Um, I had to order these. I had to put together a bunch of stuff, a bunch of other parts I needed for other things um, to get the uh, minimum $50 US order so I could get free shipping, otherwise it's just a waste of money, the shipping is 20 US so it's, you know, and these were only $3 each or something so it's sort of, you know, it's a waste of money if you do that so I always like to get orders to the point where I get free shipping and then it's just much more logical. So I <laughs> had to wait a few days for all that to happen but um, now we've done that, uh, it should be fine. So, like I said, I'm going to replace that IC with a new one here, and we'll test it again, and if that doesn't solve the problem, then I'm going to replace the 
diode and capacitor in the snubber network. Now I've actually already tested those um, out of circuit on a multimeter and capacitance tester and everything and they seem okay um, and the resistors all checked fine in circuit. I could test those in circuit due to the way they're, they're connected. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously we can't test the diode at its full breakdown voltage and all that kind of thing easily. Um, so if, if something weird's going on with that, for example, then it's much easier just to replace it because it's only, you know, 20 cent part and it's just faster to do that. So I'll, I'll uh, do that and we'll um, see what happens. So there we go. Um, I'll just replace that now. And we'll uh, see what happens to it. So, um, I don't know, there's not much to say here at this point. Just to um, reflow all the joints with uh, fresh solder, makes working on them a lot easier. Especially these ones over here, the uh, ground pins. They actually are kind of heat synced to a large piece of copper on the board, so that will make things a little bit more difficult. But, um, Yeah. It's really easy, you can just use one of these, it's a single sided board, so not um not necessary to use anything advanced. You could use solder work as well, I guess, but I like these things for this kind of thing. Works well. So there we go, I should be able to pull that out. Um, just leave it with a screwdriver. And it comes right out. So, yeah. Was it again? Top 258PN. And I think it's probably bad. So let's put a new one in. So this time I've uh, got my little IC straightening tool, which is a very handy little thing, and that uh, quite simple. I bought this originally from Dick Smith a long time ago. Um, obviously they don't sell that kind of thing anymore. They almost didn't even exist anymore and they kind of don't really because they've been bought out by another company and all they really do is sell TVs and things like that. So It's all a bit pointless. No electronics hobbyist stuff anymore. I'm sure Jcar does one of these tools though. So you just put it in, squeeze it, and it's done. You can straighten the pins by hand and stuff, but I find this thing really, really easy. So if you do a lot of stuff like that, it's quite uh, quite a good thing. Anyway, so there we go. And then I find that uh, I wasn't supposed to straighten it. Oh dear. How ironic. Oh 
Oh, well, let's see. Hmm. Well, this one looks like it's 2011. This one looks like it's 2017, so... That's quite nice. And here the uh, logo's actually changed as well from the, um... From the two. Huh. Anyway... Put that in. And that should be it, really. Now we just got to uh, plug it back in and see what happens. Um, suppose I could. Uh, suppose I could thermally monitor the new one and just see uh, see how that goes. That might be worth doing. Why not, right? Let's have a look. For a bit of fun, let's see... Uh let's see if the thing... Um see how hot this one gets. I think that should give us a pretty good indication of whether or not it's uh it's okay. Oops. Right. This is currently at 26 degrees, which makes sense because I just soldered it in, so it's going to be a bit warm. So I just set that up there. I don't know if you can see that. Hopefully you can. And we'll plug it in and see what happens. So obviously nothing's going to happen just yet. Power button, I suppose. Power button on. Okay. Monitor is running. It's not blowing up. That's a good start. The uh, temperature is increasing. 29 degrees, 29, 30. But, um, yeah, I wouldn't expect it to be going up any further than... Uh, about 57, and it's certainly not going up very quickly either. The uh, with the previous chip, it was uh, increasing much more rapidly than this, so that's a good sign. The monitor is still running; still got the light on. So let's just uh, wait here a moment and just see what happens. 35. Yeah. 34. It's going back down again. Hmm. Yes, it certainly does, um... It 
certainly does seem to be working a lot better than it was. Hmm. Yeah, I think at this point the old one would have been about 90, 95 degrees now and would have shut off. Um, and the fact that it's only at 38 degrees and it's still running is... Uh, looks like that's probably the fix. Uh, it's probably just that IC had something wrong with it. Um, this one here is probably... Well, I guess we'll never really know whether it was old age or manufacturing defect or maybe it had some ESD damage at some point. Um or something, who knows, I mean that could be um, that is one possible outcome of uh, an ESD event on an IC, it can um, create some internal shorts or something somewhere and may still operate but could run too hot uh, still though I just think it's um, I think it's just these chips, I think they're uh, too much circuitry crammed in a small package just like the previous thing with the power supply in the um, the Dell computer and um, other previous things that I've had that have blown up and failed in a similar way that's um... yeah could be it could just be a random failure I mean I don't have a uh, a huge sample size I guess but um... Yeah, anyway, so that's that, I guess. Um, looks like it's fixed. I'll have to um, verify all the uh, inputs and everything work, I guess, because obviously I bought this oops, bought this second hand, faulty. It's, um, I guess, only 40 degrees. Don't actually know the condition apart from the fact that it was uh, powering off, and as far as I know, everything else should be working though. But I haven't uh, verified that. So yeah, it seems to be um, seems to be stabilising around 40, 40.5, 40 40.6, which is what I'd expect given the uh, load and the um, ambient temperature and the open open environment and the uh, everything yeah so um looks like it's doing what it should this time hmm cool um yeah <laughs> a top 258pn little IC you can get them from digikey and mouser quite easily if you need one yourself um Unfortunately, you can't buy them in New Zealand very easily. Um, RS components do sell them, but they sell them in tubes of 50 minimum, and you would have to pay about $140. And I don't really want 50 of them. <laughs> so, um, I bought three. One for this and two spare for the future, I suppose, uh, which is good enough at the time. Don't think I'd ever need 50. Hopefully not, anyway. If you are putting together something like this, um, it's a clever idea to put screws for connectors and stuff like this um, to uh, do those screws first because they often um, will pull the connector flush with the panel and get everything aligned correctly if you do that first if you um, screw the other screws in, the mounting screws for the board um, they're quite, you know, the holes are quite, uh, quite big and there's a quite a big tolerance for whether or not the, um, screws are aligned exactly in the centre or not, so what can happen is the, um, oh no, that's the grounding screw, that's bigger. Okay. Um, if you get the, uh, board slightly misaligned, then... The um, connectors can then be uh, mounted slightly away from the panel, and when you screw the screws for them in, they um, 
we'll put mechanical st strain on the uh, on the connector and it'll pull it pull it away from the board and then the uh, solder joints will start to uh, experience strain and could crack later on and that sort of thing so that's not a great idea um, so it's always good to put the uh, things the uh, mounting screws for the connectors and stuff get those nice and tight first and then the um, the other screws won't uh, cause a problem hopefully Okay, well I didn't really show much of the reassembly because I forgot to put the LVDS cable back in before I uh, put the board in the housing and I had to undo the whole thing again and um, it was all quite annoying and I didn't bother and I didn't really have anything to say anyway so um, there was not really any point. But uh, it's all back together now. Uh, I had to, um, well I had to basically put it all, reassemble it completely um, to show you the actual picture because the way this thing is designed um, and the way the um, board housing and that doesn't actually screw onto the back of the panel and the way the panel doesn't actually clip into the front frame there's kind of, I didn't really want to, I could have propped it up on the back with some stuff but um, I'm on, on the bench here but I was too afraid that it might slip and something would get broken so um, I decided just to put the whole thing back together and uh, show you that way. So yeah, I mean obviously as you can see it it works fine. Um, <laughs> it's been going now for about half an hour or more and certainly shows no signs of stopping. So it looks like it was indeed the uh, control chip switching MOSFET integrated thing, or whatever you call it. Um, switching MOSFET with integrated control circuitry? I don't know. Anyway, this thing is uh, is bad obviously and the one that's in there now seems to fix the problem so um, yeah just a three dollar part approximately I think three dollars US and that seems to be all that was really wrong with it um, the menu works and everything which is nice um, I don't really like the capacitive buttons they're a bit weird I mean you know there's nothing wrong with them but they're kind of strange to operate and I you know it's just more extra complicated stuff to break at some point. Um, that said, tactile buttons seem to like to fail half-shorted or do weird shit sometimes, so um, maybe they're not much better, but at least they're easier to fix because you just replace one single button switch. Uh, but anyway, apart from that, um, it was very cheap. It was a fairly easy fix. It was an interesting fix because um, the symptom was quite quite interesting and uh, troubleshooting was fun, <laughs> I suppose. Um, but yeah, overall, I'm not, I'm not complaining about it. Um, I suppose in terms of image quality, it's uh, I don't think it is as sharp as that one. Um, but then I think this is a much sort of budget one, and that's a quite a high-end one. So it's not surprising. That one has five inputs, and it has picture-in-picture, picture and it has a bunch of stuff. And this is uh, not as fancy, but uh, it still does the job. Um, so yeah, that should be uh, usable now. And I should be... Uh, should be fine with it. So anyway, hopefully that video was uh, interesting. Hopefully um, uh, the, there's something to learn. Good information in there, hopefully. Um, and hopefully it was fun and entertaining or something. Anyway, so I'll uh, see you next time. <laughs>